Welcome to Channel 3. I'm Family Complex, and today we've got Dinocity. Dino City. Dino City was released in 1992 for the Super Nintendo. This is another game that was based on a movie, but it doesn't really advertise that fact. The reason why is pretty obvious. First things first, let's talk about this train wreck of a film that TV Guide called Downright Unbearable. Adventures in Dinosaur City was made by Smart Egg Pictures and originally aired in 1991 on a fledgling little cable network named the Disney Channel, which, at the time, had very little original content. It was released after the Jurassic Park novel but before the film, after The Land Before Time but before Barney. It's a weird place to be, but it's clear they weren't trying to cash in on Dinosaur Fever. They were going after the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles audience. The movie opens on three teenagers, Mick, Jamie, and Timmy. Timmy is the only immediately recognizable actor, played by Omri Katz, who you probably know from either Hocus Pocus or Erie, Indiana. We come in as Jamie is reading her self-insert dinosaur fanfiction. Then his great green lips curled sadly back from his fangs, and his voice was soft as he said, It's too bad it couldn't have worked out between us, but at least we'll always have Tartan. Meanwhile, Timmy's parents are in their lab, and they've got a 3D vector digitizer, guys, so we are in for some serious, massively realistic science here. They steal liberally from Tron and send an orange to Encom, but it turns out Master Control has no use for it and tosses it back. This is enough proof that the transport process works, so they gather it up and take off, of course leaving the equipment ready to transport again. The kids start watching their favorite cartoon, Dinosaurs. We're not even 10 minutes in and we've already got a fully animated masturbation joke. Who is this movie for? No. Right. Dinosaur is about this really awesome world where your friends are sores. We'll take a chunk out of anybody who skates. Today I learned that true friends take a chunk out of people for you. I don't think I have any friends. Oh, and in case you hadn't already figured it out, this cartoon is terrible. So Timmy does the obvious and invites them into his parents' lab to watch the cartoon on the big screen TV. Timmy grabs Chekhov's remote and it goes exactly the way you'd expect. They're transported into the cartoon in a sequence that goes on way too long, but at least the effect kind of holds up, which is more than I can say for a lot of these films. They meet Fori, this weird little flightless puppet, just as the villains show up. These guys are the Rockies, our stereotypical Neanderthal villains. The main two here are Link, who's predictably a big dumb caveman, and Missy, who only seems to exist in this film as a sex object. Which is odd, considering this movie was supposed to have been made for children, right? Just wait. It gets worse. The Neanderthals steal a fuse from the power plant, which apparently drives the cooling systems to keep the lava from rising up and destroying the city. They leave a guard, who also only exists in this movie for the purpose of fart jokes. Ugh. They assume that the fuse is the reason they can't return home, so they convince Fori to travel to Tar Town to get Rex and Tops, the heroes of the cartoon. Because the train is controlled by the Rockies, they have to travel through Extinction Grove, which is built up as this terrifying place from which no one ever returns, but of course nothing really happens. We meet Mr. Big, the main big bad, who is cloaked and obviously clearly not a dinosaur. Mr. Big keeps a little person as a slave and kills a guy. But he's not all bad. Mr. Big just wants to be the next to be with you. They reach Tar Town and find a bunch of drunken debauchery. Yep, we're in this shit now. And we meet a dinosaur whore. Dino whore? Dino whore. Looking for action, big boy? <laughs> One thing that bothers me about this scene is that all the dinosaurs stop and stare as the kids enter the bar, but there are actually already humans in the bar. Like pebbles here. Been ages since you came around my cave. Who is this movie for? Oh. Right. So the kids try to convince Rex and Tops to go with them, and they refuse the call. 
Because story beats, just go with it. The Rockies show up and remind everyone that Rex's father is a traitor and a bar fight breaks out. And Mick finds out that he fucking loves violence. Jamie's glasses break because of course they do, and by the unbreakable rule of 90s films, I guess she's hot now. After the fight, Rex decides they'll go with them. No real reason, just kinda does. Mick and Jamie share a kiss and... You broke your glasses and lost your retainer? Your parents are gonna be pissed. They reveal Mr. Big is an Allosaurus and no way is a dinosaur, holy shit I didn't see that coming. I mean they showed us he was a dinosaur in the intro to the cartoon, I'm not sure who they were trying to fool here. Apparently Rex's father made a deal with Mr. Big and gave him a key to the city gates. Mr. Big took over the tower and there's absolutely no explanation as to why there's any importance to the tower at all. They do make mention of it but they never tie it up. Great story work, guys. It's about your lucky night. You got to see the last in action with his big club. Yeah, that's not the kind of action I had in mind. Who is this movie for? Oh, the whole family. Okay. Another fight breaks out, and we get to see the greatest physical comedy in the film. And I don't mean these half-assed Three Stooges bits. I mean watching these guys in dinosaur costumes try to fight. Then Timmy discovers that the remote has the ability to pause and rewind the Rockies. Now, okay, I can forgive all the stupid logic up to this point because we're in an authentically terrible 90s cartoon, but the remote working inside the cartoon world makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Even if it could work, it shouldn't work like this. He'd rewind the film itself, thus rewinding time, not the people, right? I am definitely thinking way too hard about this stupid, stupid film. But it does get us a first look at Mr. Big, and yeah, looks as bad as the others. Which is a real shame, because the dinosaurs in this film were done by Greg Aronowitz, who also worked on the television show Dinosaurs. No, not that bullshit. The network sitcom, which actually had great animatronics. He was also the one that did the weapons and props for the guild, and more importantly, that amazing painting of Felicia Day and Will Wheaton. Also on the topic of Mr. Big, the man in the costume is R.A. Mihailov, who played Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And I'm sad now. Oh, he's scaly, man. We laid him out like turtles. We get it, you're cooler than the Ninja Turtles. Our heroes get to the tower and... Sitting beneath the bell looks like some kind of alarm. Hey, I got an idea. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-uh. Oh, so way, guys. Uh -uh. <laughs> yep, that girl is a teenager. Cool. Cool. Excuse me, boys. I was looking for somebody who was supposed to be getting off. <laughs> Duty, I mean. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, still a goddamn teenager. So Jamie knocks the Rockies out and they continue on. Rex finds his father in a cell and calls him a traitor. Again, because that's a plot point we haven't explored enough yet. His father explains that he was given a potion that made him do it. And just like that, everything's cool again. So why did we spend all that time... You know what? Fuck it, I don't care. His father offers to sacrifice himself and destroy the tower, and we get this amazing line delivery. Father! Eh, Douglas did it better. They take the plot hole express elevator to exactly where they're holding Timmy at exactly the right time, and... You won't use it the way you did against my father, Big. Wow! Oh, flub the line. Cut. No. Keep rolling. Okay. Next we get a 90s staple cat fight, and the real main event, an all-out, knock-down, drag-out Goomba fight. You hellish humanoid little filth! <laughs> Okay, the line Neanderthal trollop alone almost makes up for the rest of the bad writing. Almost. So Timmy gets the remote back and... Later, dude. What, what button did he even push? Why is there a disintegration feature on this VCR? What is happening and why are there still 20 minutes left in this movie? Forey offers to fly the fuse back while the others escape because pulling the fuse will shut down the elevators. Here the movie tries to give Missy a female empowerment moment, but just kind of falls on its face. That's one giant leap for womankind. The lava's released, which somehow causes the tower to blow up. 
I don't know, they must have had budget left over after obviously skimping on the animatronics. They say their goodbyes and Rex inexplicably quotes Jamie's bad fanfiction. Remember Jamie, we'll always have Tar down. So the whole movie they were chasing this fuse as the key to go home, but as it turns out they could have gone home any time and saved me an hour and a half of torment. Go figure. They do their weird little dance again and what even is that? Like, why? The kids return home just as Timmy's parents get back from their science meeting thing. And Timmy celebrates all the important lessons he learned by sending everyone, including his parents, back into the cartoon. And that's Adventures in Dinosaur City. It's mind-numbingly awful, but I'm sure some of you probably have fond memories of this tripe, so go ahead and state your case in the comments. Finally, with that out of the way, let's talk about Dino City. In the game, our main characters are still Timmy and Jamie, but with vastly different character designs. Oh, and they're siblings this time. And no Mick. No big loss. Oh, and on the topic of the character designs, who's this kid on the movie poster? And who's this other kid on the game's box art? How many children must this terrible cartoon claim before it's satisfied? In the game's version of the story, the kids go to watch the cartoon on their parents' science equipment. Descriptive. They get sucked in and the story's basically the same. Get the fuse to go home, fight Mr. Big, avoid sex in the city references. You play a team of two as either Timmy and Rex or Jamie and Tops. As Rex, you punch enemies, and as Tops, you shoot projectiles. Both are able to jump on heads and dispatch enemies as well. Really though, playing with Jamie and Tops makes the most sense because the ability to shoot enemies from a distance is way easier than getting up close. Both kids can jump off their respective dinosaurs and you need to in order to get past some puzzles. The puzzles aren't bad, but I really wish the game had more of them. Of course, when you're off the dinosaur, your only defense is that damn remote from the movie. With it, you can shoot and pause enemies. It's helpful when you need it, but without the dinosaurs, the kids are completely useless. The game has six stages, each with 20 possible paths, though most of the paths are repeated. Bonus stages also randomly pop up for health boosts and extra lives. And you'll need those. This game is balls hard. Of course, it's basically just pattern memorization. There's not a lot of variance in enemy patterns, and there's very, very little randomness, so if you're a speedrunner, this might be a good game for you. The game uses a password system, and a password is issued in between each stage. You have three lives and three continues. Once those are gone, you have to start over from the password screen, which puts you back at the beginning of the stage. Thankfully, if you leave the system on, the game will remember the last password, so you don't have to keep putting them in. So that all sounds pretty good, right? Well... You see, Timmy, this world's not so perfect. The controls are usually just fine, if a little odd, but there are times it just doesn't respond. In my playthrough, it seemed to happen mostly when buttons are hit in fast succession, but it doesn't really matter why it happens. In a game where platforming is key, it is an unbreakable rule that if you hit the jump button, the character should really at least make its best attempt at making a fucking jump. Even worse than that is the slowdown. It employs a lot of pretty nice looking mode 7 effects, but each time it does, especially if there's more than one or two enemies on screen, it slows to a crawl. There are a number of levels that are clearly inspired by the Reznor boss in Super Mario World with these rotating platforms, and Christmas lights, I think? These levels are the absolute worst, as they throw wave after wave of enemies at you while the system struggles to render everything that's happening. You can get used to the slowdown here and compensate for it, but the dropped inputs seem to double when the game is lagging. This constant nightmare makes these levels even harder than the final boss battle with Mr. Big. I'm not saying Mr. Big isn't hard to beat. On the contrary. But at least the game version is sporting that sweet 90s track jacket, right? We haven't seen dinosaur action this cool since Color a Dinosaur. After the fight, the tower collapses and Fori flies the fuse back to the power plant. Real world? This is their real world. That's just rude, Jamie. And what's all this we business, for you? We get a credit sequence that's clearly inspired by Super Mario World and... Wait, Cindy? Her name was Missy, right? Fun fact, Cindy's fright was pretty heavily modified from the Japanese version. She was given less revealing clothing and a friendlier expression. Also, she's a lot skinnier. Why you gotta do them thick thighs like that, Irem? But it's not all bad, so let's wrap up this Dino City adventure and get to our scores.
As of the time this was written, Dino City has an average loose cartridge price of about $12, which is a 5 out of 6 on our price scale. Graphically, the game is bright and well animated. The only real gripe is the sprites for the kids, but that's minor and doesn't hamper the game. It's a 5 out of 6. For sound, well, it's okay. The music and sound effects are decent enough to do the job, but the repetitiveness of the design means the music is also repeated and gets pretty old. 3 out of 6. Gameplay? Honestly, this one's a tough call. The game is fun, or at least has its moments, but the unforgivable control failures pretty much kill any desire to continue. 2 out of 6. Replayability is actually pretty good. With the branching paths, there's quite a bit to see, even if a lot of it's repeated. There is a chance you won't see every level on your first playthrough, so if you didn't absolutely hate the massive glaring problems this game has, you'd probably like another few tries. But that's a huge asterisk, so it's still a 4 out of 6. My personal take? It's not that bad. Overall, I give it a solid 3 out of 6. Which means our final score comes to... 3.2! A little better than expected. And now on to the awards. Today we covered a movie and a game, so per my own made-up rules that I just made up just now, I'll be giving awards separately to each. First, the movie. The Dancing Goomba Award goes to the Mr. Big Fight. I genuinely didn't find much to like in this movie, but at least it's amusing watching these guys in ridiculous costumes trying to pull off fight choreography. And the Half a Dragon Medallion Award goes to... all the jarring and frankly confusing sexual content. I get that basically every film in the 80s and 90s had mandatory breasts in it, but this is just unnecessary. It's not particularly funny and serves no practical purpose in the movie. To the game. The Golden Key Award goes to the game's vibrant and well-animated graphics. I've got to hand it to Dino City. For all its flaws, the background and most of the sprites look really great. The Stale Wall Chicken Award goes to these godforsaken rotating platforms. There's a reason Yoshi's Island used the Super FX2 chip for scaling and rotation. These problems had to have come up in playtesting. Who does this? And a special award for today, which we'll call the Neanderthal Trollop Award, goes to the Japanese version of Cindy. You can get it, you pixelated Venus. And that's Dino City. It's a game that really could have been great with a little more work, but input issues and slowdown all but ensured its place as a mediocre footnote in IREM's classic catalog. And that's all for today. I'm Famicomplex, and keep your sets tuned to Channel 3.